much. You know, this song is a covenant promise, right? We're not just singing Jehovah Nissi, fight my battles, Jehovah Rapha, heal me. This is the promise of who God is. How good is that? Uh, so good. Hey, worship team, thank you so much. Uh, please take a seat. It is great to be here with you this morning. Get yourself comfy. And let's just start off in prayer. So if you want to bow your heads, Father, we thank you um, for this moment right here. We thank you for your name. We thank you that you are Jehovah Nissi, that you are Jehovah Jireh, that you are the God who heals us and the God who gives us peace. And we just thank you for all that you are for us, that you never change, that your promise is true today. Um, and I just pray that God, Holy Spirit, you would guide my words and, and help it impact where it needs to impact. And I pray that hearts would be open to receive your word this morning. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hey, great to be with you. Um, and I have the absolute pleasure of finishing up on our Jehovah series uh, today. And it's been, a, it's been a whirlwind. We've had uh, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. We've had Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. We've had Jehovah Jireh last week, which was fantastic. The Lord will provide. Um, and I get to finish off, and everyone knows what it is because we just sung it, so it's no surprise to you. Um, and I'm just going to take us back quickly to this idea of Jehovah, right? Jehovah is God's being or existence. Yeah, God is this. These are the character traits of God that we're exploring. And we're really exploring how he's made covenant with us through his name. These parts of himself that he's revealed have become promises to us as he reveals himself to us. And it, it, it stays all the way through when that altar was built and it said, this is Jehovah Nissi. I am Jehovah Rapha. Yeah. Those promises haven't changed. And, and that's really exciting. And I, I just love that. Um, and today we're just going to, we're going to explore Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. I don't know. The first thing that I, um, I got when I, when I was like, okay, I'm preaching on Shalom. Um, if any of you have seen Friday Night Takeaway and it's like, Shalom, Jackie. If anyone... <laughs> That was my first bit. Some of you will know, some of you won't, but it's just, you know, the first thing, eat so bad that at school, um, I would just sometimes, people will walk in, I'd be like, shalom, and I don't know where it came from, it's just in my vocabulary now. Um, but I really want to kind of explore Jehovah Shalom with you today. Um, and there's a lot of power in a name, isn't there? And um, some of you may know, but Chloe is expecting, which is very exciting. Um, but on that, we've now um, lost the peace because we have to fight about names. And Chloe and I don't usually fight, but we're not really in agreement on names. Chloe's very much, it has to have a good meaning. I'm like, it has to sound really good. And not too many names go well with Sutherland and a nice flow. And so we're kind of um, exploring that. And we found out on Monday that it's going to be a girl. Yeah. So, you know, the name choices have narrowed down by 50%, which is all good. Um, but names have meanings, right? My name means twin. Chloe said, well, I would never name a child that. It's a terrible meaning. And I was like, well, thanks, okay. Uh, and so we've been exploring, and there's different names, and we've been looking, and it's like, this name means the twig. And you're like, hmm, yeah, that's not going to work. Sounds good, but doesn't work. Some means like uh, of the earth. And she was like, eh, of the earth, yeah, okay. Um, and some are really good, like cord into heaven, or like God's own like, daughter or son. And you're like, yeah, but it doesn't sound so good. So, you know... <laughs> We're working on it. Um, but peace is an interesting concept, right? And uh, thinking about shalom and thinking about peace, I was like, peace is broad. It's a feeling often, isn't it? A feeling that comes over you or a feeling you feel like you can feel really at peace with a decision or you can feel really at peace in a situation or you can feel really comfortable and at peace with your future or you cannot. And sometimes the, it doesn't seem quite a controllable thing. You're like, I don't like that. That is not putting me at ease. I'm not happy. That is not peace for me. And we can go about different ways. Um, we just spent a lovely time with Jen and Nikki uh, down in Dorset. And I felt at peace. There was nature. There were nice walks, good company. I was at peace. But it's not always like that. And I came home, and luckily it was very peaceful. But sometimes it's not, and you come back into chaos. Um, and it's a really broad concept to talk about peace. And so I, I've tried to put it together as best I can, uh, kind of looking through the Bible and, and looking at what it says. Um, but I feel that Jehovah Shalom can seem a little bit distant at the moment, a little bit in short supply. Um, and I kind of wanted to pin it down to a couple of things. And I think the main issue that we have at the moment is stress. Yeah. That's what's ruining the peace, right? 
And I got a couple statistics because um, stress is a serious problem. And it's only getting more stressful, right? We started in our nice farming communities, small towns, no phones. It was lovely. We plowed the land, milked the cows, went to bed, made cheese, did it all again the next day. Easy life, right? We're not like that now. You go to a restaurant, yeah, but you have to drive to, pay for your parking, sort it out, go and get your food because we don't have cows in our gardens anymore. And so we're there and then you, have, you can't order because you have to log on to something, but the internet doesn't work and then you have to get your payment. And it's like, how many layers just to get some food? It's madness, right? We've added all these layers of stress and complexity into society. And I looked at some statistics. Well, first, let me go. Stress what is defined kind of as this. It's the body's reaction to feeling threatened or under pressure. And I think a lot of things are making us feel under threat or under pressure at the moment. Um, and these were some of the statistics. One in 14 adults in the UK say they feel stressed every day. Only 7% of young adults say they have never experienced feeling overwhelmed due to stress. That means 93% have felt overwhelmed due to stress. 74% of people in the UK uh, are, feel so overwhelmed by stress at point they feel like they are unable to cope, according to this statistic. And stress-related illness costs the UK 8.13 billion per year. So it's a serious issue. And it doesn't paint a good picture. And I just took a few. I plucked a few from all of the statistic websites I was looking at on stress. And then I thought about this. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm someone who reads the news in the morning. Like, I'll kind of roll off. Phone, probably not the best way to wake up, but you know, it's just how I do. And then I go straight to BBC News because I try and be good and not go on social media. So I choose the news. Oh gosh. Um, and I go straight to the news. And this is what I get bombarded with as my early morning stresses uh, the cost of living crisis, soaring mortgages, 100 pounds to fill up your car, uh, the wars in the Ukraine and Israel that are happening at the moment, causing chaos, strife, bloodshed that's all happening, uh, the murder and crime that is going on close to home and, and further around in the UK, uh, the government apologizing for their latest mess up or screw up or immoral thing that they've done, and then the mass shootings in the US that could be avoided, and they're my first news things that I wake up to. And I'm like, no wonder I wake up and feel stressed because we're bombarded with all this noise from the moment we get up, all throughout the day, this has gone wrong, this is happening, did you hear about this, I can't believe this. It's just chaos all the time. And we're kind of struggling and floating and kind of going, how do I find Jehovah Shalom amongst all of this? And the world, lots of people say, I just want to be happy. I'm just looking for peace. I just want peace and quiet. We seem to always be looking for peace, but not really able to find it. And I'm wondering where it's all gone so wrong. And um, when I was on holiday a year ago, I read a book called When the Body Says No, linking a bit into my statistics. And it was all about how stress is causing things like cancer and autoimmune disease and how our, our mental, is, mental health is linked in with our physical health and how all the things that you wouldn't suspect, like people-pleasing and uh, being under pressure and working really stressful jobs, actually are really not good for our body. And that the body will just say no. Um, and we have all these things that are happening. And I don't want to paint a grim, a grim picture, but I'm really glad that we do have an answer that we're going to go through today. Because the world doesn't seem to have the answers. We have all the science, all the research, all of the social universities looking at all of this stress. And it's like, well, what's the answer? How do we find it? And it seems to me that at the moment, society is edging more away from God and from faith. It's trying to do everything individu individualistically on, on our own. You know, I think this, look after yourself, you don't, don't interact with, just have time to yourself, focus on you. And we're stepping away from God. God is being banned in schools. It's not okay to worship anymore. You can't say a prayer. It's not good to share your faith in the workplace, right? They're limiting God and they're limiting faith and they're limiting Jehovah Shalom. And we're stepping away from the peace that we find in Jesus Christ, our Prince of Peace. If we actually look at it, we have to stand on the covenant of peace that was founded in Jehovah Shalom, right? And so that's what we're going to have a look at today. And I started off saying, when we, when we say Jehovah Shalom, it's more than a name. It's a covenant promise. Maybe we can even think of it as a gift, something given to us through God. 
Now, the first mention of Jehovah Shalom is in Judges 6. Um, this is when uh, our good friend Gideon, some of you might have heard of him, uh, he is hiding from the Midianites. And I'm going to kind of go through a bit of the history, and then we'll, we'll pick up and read the scripture. Um, but basically, at this point, the Lord, in Judges 6, the, God appears to Gideon in the form of an angel uh, and starts talking to him and saying, basically, Gideon, I want you to do this. Gideon goes, what the heck? No, thank you. Uh, God goes, well, I've asked you. And Gideon goes, fine, prove your God. God proves himself. And Gideon goes, oh, cool, I'm at peace. That's it in a nutshell. But I'm going to go through in a bit more detail. Uh, Israel as a nation were kind of being hunted, right, by this uh, group, this enemy called the Midianites. Um, These were a once defeated enemy that have come back to plunder, ravage, destroy, oppress Israel because of their uh, lack of faithfulness towards God. And you kind of see this pattern in the Old Testament. Uh, The Israelites go, yeah, God, I'm a bit bored of you now. Uh, I'm going to go worship this thing over here. God's like, how dare you? I'm going to punish you with seven years of the enemy. The Israelites go, oh no, what's happening? Where's God gone? What's happened? Oh no. And then God goes, ha ha, here I am. Right? And it kind of goes in a cycle. There's lots of it. Uh, It's great fun. They really don't learn these Israelites at points, do they? But then it's very much like us as humans, right? Um, So Israel's being oppressed by the Midianites. Uh, It is not a good time. And they couldn't cope. Um, And so they were hiding in the the caves and in the caverns. They'd gone. They'd left their humble abodes, left their cows in their fields. No more cheese was being made. And they were hiding in the cliffs. Um, And maybe you're a bit like that. I know I am. If there is an issue, like, I have a very unchaotic life, and I like it that way. And so when chaos comes, I disappear. I'm good at it. You won't find me right? I'm just gone. You'll be like, this is happening. I'll be like, <laughs> goodbye. And I'm just gone. Um, maybe you're a bit like me. You like to hide when, when everything goes a bit uh, askew. But the Midianites, they were plundering, they were destroying, ravaging, ruining anything they could find of the Israelites. There was certainly no peace. There was a lot of certain disruption and chaos. And in verse 6, they cry out to the Lord to help them. And I just love the Bible because it is so relatable. It's just humans being humans over and over and over again. And if you look at this kind of metaphorically or, or apply it to your own life, you will just be able to see your own situations in this, in this passage. And, and so we're going to look at it. Um, and then basically God sends, sends in a prophet to Israel who reminds them that, of this. God goes, I rescued you from Egypt. I took you from slavery. I delivered you from all of your oppression. I drove all of your enemies away. I gave you their land because the Israelites are in the promised land at the moment. And I said this to you, Israelites. I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the Amorites. And you didn't listen. That's what he says. And so, you know, I just think, how many times was God there? Literally just like, I said this, you did this. This is the consequence. Come on, right? He's like, look at all I've done for you, but still you're not listening to what I've asked you to do. As I said, the cycle continues. And we're going to pick up in verse 11 uh, with Gideon, um, who was doing a wonderful job of hiding from the Midianite oppression in verse 11. We're going to kick off, uh, and I'll read. It should come up on the screens. It says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash and the Ab. Abiez right, we're going to go with that, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did the Lord not bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us to the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that this is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an epaph he made flour, he made an epaph of flour, he made bread without yeast, putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. 
the angel of the God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in Oprah of the Abiyah's rites. And that's where we're going to end our reading. So this is where we meet Jehovah Shalom. And the altar was built to consecrate that promise, that covenant, that meeting, that um, encounter with God. And I've, I've got a couple of points that I'm going to try and draw out of this. And the first one is about a future of certainty. And I think this is really interesting. Um, because certainty, I think, is our key to having peace. I've, I've said, and I was, when I was speaking with a friend a long time ago, he said, when I was, he, was, um, he was going through a difficult time, he was in with some bad people, um, and he said, that when we were talking about it after he became Christian, he said, um, one of the scariest things that I ever had in that point in my life was those uncertain people that you didn't know what they were going to do. You couldn't tell. I wasn't afraid unless I was out with them because I didn't know what was going to happen, right? Um, and so we're going to look at a future of certainty first. And when I teach creative writing, because um, I'm an English teacher, uh, one of the things I love to teach my students about their characters is that to make an interesting character, they have to be relatable and they have to be flawed, right? And we meet Gideon. He's in the wine press where he shouldn't be. He's not meant to thrash wheat in a wine press, right? And Gideon is flawed, because he has done what all of us do. He's stepped from the promise of God had. He's followed the generation and he's gone, I'm going to kind of flow this way. right? I'm going to go worship those other people. And I don't understand why God still isn't, I'm not being obedient, but why is God not doing what he's meant to do, right? Where, where's it all gone wrong? And so he's kind of fallen down in, into this, this trap. He was anxious, he was stressed out, and he was hiding away from the Midianites. And he was probably in a funk. He was in a mood. Right, if I was threshing wheat in the wine press, I would be in a mood. I wouldn't be happy about it. I would be complaining. Right? It was this private, unsuspecting place in which he could evade. He could hide. He could not be noticed. And that's the best bit because that's when God's going to come and find you. You know, if you're there and you're like, oh, I really don't want to do that. So you kind of like edge away and make yourself really small. And then God's like, hello. I choose you. Um, so God, Gideon's there, he's hiding, and God appears to him um, because God will always find you. You can't hide from God. And I love that God called Gideon a mighty warrior because God saw Gideon a completely different way from how Gideon saw Gideon, right? Gideon was hiding, he was evading, he was not a mighty warrior at this point, but God called him as it was to be because God was certain of his future, right? So he said it as it was, okay? And God also does this. This was a time of great distress for the, for the Israelites, but God had to come at the point of the greatest distress because God has to prove himself over and over and over and over and over again to us. And it might seem like, why is God letting this happen? Because he knows that people are going to forget, he knows that we're going to be disobedient. He knows we're going to go and worship something silly. He knows we're going to be idolatrous. He knows that we're not perfect. And so he goes, look, you will get yourself into this, but the promise is I will always be there to save you. And he comes in the, in the moment of greatest distress because it shows him in all of his power. You thought this was impossible. You are being destroyed but Gideon, I've called you and you'll defeat them all. And that, as I've said it, that's how it will be, right? When God comes into the situation, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are because he is bigger than the circumstance. And what's good about this is, is God never changes in the situation, right? The, the Israelites went up and down and up and down, but God stays consistent. He never changes. And so he reminds them of who he was. And just imagine if we as Christians, just for a second, could take all all of those promises that God gives us, all of those things that he says about us, the promises he makes to us, and rather than coming back each week going, well, God, I'm not feeling it this week, 
it became truth for us. And rather than being a conversation of, God, I need you to refill me and re-promise me this and reprove yourself to me. And God, come on, show me who you are again because I don't feel it. We we're like, God, I know exactly who you are. And this is what I'm going to go and do about it. Imagine how much time we'd save. Be incredible. Imagine what he could do if we just stayed obedient to who he was and to his word. All this time of re-revealing himself. We have a whole Old Testament. It takes a long time to get through. Yeah, we're, we're human. And we can't blame ourselves. And God knows we need reminders. God knows we need to see him. God knows we need it. And so he put it all in his word. This is why the Bible is so powerful. Because he doesn't have to keep showing up like he did. He's like, I've got it all here for you. You can access me at any time. You don't need to wait till the darkest moment. I'm here right at the beginning. Okay? Um, And so God appeared to Gideon. He said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And he started with that phrase, and I think it's interesting. He said, the Lord is with you. God being all-knowing, yeah, all-powerful, he knew what Gideon's worry was. He felt that he was on his own. He was in this little hut in the wine press, hiding from an enemy that was galloping about, destroying everything. And he goes, I know what you're feeling. I see see what it is. I am with you. You think I've abandoned you? Yeah, because Gideon was like, God, you did all this. You rescued me from Egypt. You gave us the promised land. You've done all these things for me. So why are we now in this? It wasn't joining up. The dots did not join up for Gideon because he thought God was one way, right? He thought God would only, you know, look after them. And God will. But there's a covenant promise that you had to be a part of. He said, if you do this, this is how the promised land will be, right? God gives you the option. There's always the free choice. If you are obedient to my word, this is how it will be. And then we always choose the opposite. And Gideon couldn't understand why all this was happening. Because God had proved himself before in Egypt, in the land. And he's thinking, where was God? And so on the first bit, Gideon needed to be reminded of who God was. That the Lord was still with him, had always been with him. All of that. And he, he listened to Gideon kind of complain lament about the situation but he ignored it God didn't kind of go oh yeah I know it's really tough he just said this in verse 14 the Lord turned to him and said go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand am I not sending you that question is interesting there isn't it am I not sending you because God is saying if I'm sending you and I've asked you to do this the certainty is that it will be done right? If I've sent you and you're obedient and you go, whatever strength you have, you could be on the ground or whatever, it's going to happen. Yeah, that's God is speaking with certainty. When God speaks, it is certain of the future, right? This was the call for Gideon. This was the challenge, but Gideon didn't have the peace. He hadn't established that moment of Jehovah Shalom yet. Yeah, he didn't have the courage. He didn't feel he had the strength. He felt abandoned and disillusioned with, with everything that was happening. And so Gideon goes, pardon me, my Lord, (laughs) how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And he's putting everything back on himself. But it's me. I can't do it in my way, right? Which is what we do. I need to find my peace. I need to do this. No, it's God's word that gives you the peace, okay? And Gideon couldn't step into the call because he didn't have a certainty of who he was in God, of the call. He didn't have a certainty of that future, He didn't have a certainty about the situation. He didn't have a certainty of who God was. He didn't understand it at this point. And for so many of us, the lack of um, peace comes from a lack of certainty. Whether it's about ourselves and our identity, about our purpose, about our situation, about the future that we are holding on to, about who we can trust or who we can rely on, we don't have the certainty. But God answers. And it says this in verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all of the Midianites, leaving none alive, right? That's what he says. All of my promise, all of my character, all of my strength, all of all of who I am will be with you. And this is what will happen. Gideon's still not ready though. Well, if I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking. It's not enough because peace is abstract, right? The future is abstract. These are things that cannot be certain for us unless we trust in God who expands all of time, who expands all of our knowledge. It can't make sense to us. And for some of you, that's going to be a real big issue 
I can't make sense of that, and so I can't track along with it, because it doesn't make sense to me. And that's where we have to take that step of faith and go, well, I'm going to believe what God says because I believe in who God is, right? And we have to make that jump because I'm not going to understand everything. It's impossible to understand God. It will never make sense. It can't. But I'm going to trust in what God says, right? So Gideon sets up his test and, and God meets Gideon because he needed the certainty. God said, I will wait for you. You go prepare, prepare your test. I will be here. God knew that Gideon needed that. He would know that you need that. God knows you. Yeah. He needed that certainty. And when Gideon is given that certainty, when the angel of the Lord touches the offering and it bursts into flames, Gideon goes, right, okay. The promises that came back from before that Gideon knew, oh, you're the God who saved us from Egypt. You're the God who did this. It made sense to him. Okay. And the Lord said, peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. Now, that bit, you are not going to die, could be taken in two ways, right? Gideon might think, "Uh uh-oh, I've been real sinful right now. Is God about to smite me? It could mean that, right? Don't worry. I know I'm God here with you right now. You're not going to die. Maybe it means that when I've sent you out, don't worry, you are not going to die. Your future is secure, right? And we can look at it in two different ways, and maybe I need to go back into that a little bit more. Um, And that's when Gideon consecrated it. He said, so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is Peace. And to this day it stands in Oprah of the Abia's rites. Now, altars can be there for many reasons. They can be there for sacrifice, for worship, to commemorate an encounter, to make a covenant, and to find refuge. And this altar was a tribute and a reminder of God's promise of peace. It's symbolic. And what it does is it makes the abstract real, right? Because God, the angel didn't sit there forever on the altar, ready to put your offering into fire and re-reveal himself. It was a, a, a symbolic moment of that encounter where God gave Gideon peace. And so this is a challenge for us because kind of the certainty was changed. Gideon was certain in his moment. And for us, we have a different certainty. Our certainty comes through Jesus Christ. And in John 14, 6, it says this, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So we've got a different certainty now because we're switching from the the covenant of God in the Old Testament to the covenant that Jesus made on that cross. And the covenant is this in John 3.16. For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We've got to take this certainty at face value. And I know this this is big stuff. Yeah, we have to take the promise that he made on that cross at face value. No one can know what's going to happen when we die. It's a step of faith to live as a Christian and to believe in the certainty of the promise. And this is where the certainty of our future is interesting because we'll have a different view of the future. Your future could be in one week from now, and that's where you draw your line of the future. Your future could be in a year, five years, ten years. We all have different views of the future. But the future that is secured is your eternal life when you die, right? We have limited lifespan here, but we have a future that was bought on that cross, yeah, beyond the short term that we're thinking. And so we need to start thinking with the eternal eyes and not with our short-term minds. And that's a challenge. That's a big challenge. And the certainty is the truth will come in in eternal life. Now, Our peace has to be that no matter what happens to me, I am with the Lord. He has promised me this, and as a believer, I have got eternal life. That's the promise we're sticking on to, because the world will offer you no certainty. Life is fragile. We cannot guarantee tomorrow. Moments are fragile. Relationships are fragile. Yeah, material possessions are fragile. Things come and things go. The world is dark, chaotic, and uncertain. And so we have to find a certainty somewhere else. And it is in the promises of God in the Bible. Jehovah Shalom is perfect peace in the chaos. That is the promise to you because of his word. Now, how do you find this peace in the chaos? And this is where I was a bit like, oh, this is abstract. This isn't really making sense to me. How do I get there? And the kind of the answer I came up with is to take a step of faith. You have to make a decision to believe in God's certainty and in God's promise. That's the only way you can do it. You have to make a logical decision. 
I am going to believe that this is true. This is my truth, okay? And it kind of makes me think of this. I was thinking a bit of uh, Jesus on the lake, where Jesus had certainty of where he was going, who he was, but the disciples weren't on the same page, right, when he's out in that lake. Um, and in Luke 8, 24, 25, it says, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. Then they asked him, then he asked them, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. Jesus, when he got on that boat, knew the certainty of where he was going. He knew his future and he had no doubt about it. The disciples didn't have an understanding of who Jesus was and the certainty that he brought. Okay? Jesus asked, where is their faith? They haven't understood the promise of... When he stepped onto that boat, there was no doubt what was going to happen. Not a single doubt. It was certain for Jesus. Now, Gideon, at the end of this, was able to head out into war in perfect peace because he was standing on God's word. The future was uncertain apart from God's word. Right, And this is the really difficult bit that we have to get around our head. It's God's word that proves true, not the situational parameters that we find ourselves in. And so it comes down to this question. Do you believe that you can trust in God's word? And that's a decision no one can make for you. You can sit here, you can listen to it, you can go, hmm, that's interesting, or kind of. And then you have to ask yourself this. Am I prepared to accept that this is now my truth? And that's a really big question to ask yourself. Because <laughs> this is how, how me and uh, my friend Jesse, we go. This is how we go. We'll, we'll catch up for lunch quite often. Um, and we will talk about the same thing every time because we're not certain. Um, Jesse, how you doing? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Um, how you feeling about, you know, the future? What's happening? How's your job? How's the thing? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if this is going to happen. I don't know if that's going to happen. I'm like, oh, me too. Really got this going on. and I don't know if this is going to make sense. And we have this same conversation. And what we've had to get to a point of realizing, and this is how we finish every time now, it doesn't matter where we're at now because God's got the future. And we're just like, it's all going to be good because God's in it. And we've changed our conversation as we've gone on because we never found an answer in years of having this conversation. And it comes down, Gideon had this communication with God, right? He had a moment where he said, God, let me test you. I don't understand this, God. He had moments of communication with God. And Gideon worked with God and argued with God, tested God. But Gideon was there, and God was there, and they worked it out. So maybe you have to go and work out your uncertainties and your doubts. And you need to find the truth. And you'll either choose to find it in God's word, or you'll choose to find it somewhere else. Or you'll just swim about in in a pool of uncertainty, (laughs) this liminal space that doesn't really make sense to you. And you'll never find a way forward because you have to settle somewhere. Gideon settled on the side of truth, on the altar of truth, on Jehovah Shalom. He found peace which enabled him to go out into war, to win in perfect peace. And I have so much more, but I'm going to run out of time. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip that bit and I'm going to come to this bit. I'm going to tell you that Jesus is the future. Humanity likes predictable, stable certainty. And this is certainty in God when everything else is unclear, right, that we're talking about. Too often we rely on what we see, on our experiences, on our past moments to define everything for us. I know them, they're going to be like this. I know what happens here. This is going to be like this because I've seen it before, I've read it. But it doesn't always line up with God's truth. We have to put our faith in Jesus because He was the promise of peace. Jesus is the future. He is our long-term certainty of peace. He is our hope. It was prophesied in Isaiah 9, 6. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is our peace. Jesus is our peace. And in Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The promise that was made on that altar in Oprah is the promise of peace that Jesus carries as part of the Trinity. The covenant that created or showed Jehovah Shalom is the same peace that Jesus offers. 
And his presence is available to you right now. Jehovah Shalom is available to you right now. The Prince of Peace is available to you right now. And it takes you deciding on where your truth is. Because God is always true to his promise. Yeah? And I, I, I've given lots of scripture. And I'm going to give some more in the last 30 seconds that I have. Because God is present for you and he is for you. And peace is available to you. And in John 14, 27, it says this, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled and afraid. If you put your future in Jesus, in Jehovah Shalom, you have a peace of mind and heart. That is supernatural. You won't understand it. You pray in those moments of chaos and confusion at work and in life and you go, God, I'm giving this to you because I can't do it in my own strength. Gideon couldn't do it in his own strength. And so you go, God, this is over to you. Watch, what, look at how you feel. It'll be different. It'll be different. And Jesus wanted to prepare us. He gave us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit carries the same covenant of Jehovah Shalom for you. When you pray to the Holy Spirit and you go, Holy Spirit, give me peace in this situation, that covenant still stands for you. John 16, 33 says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me here on earth. You will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So I'm gonna finish with this. Step one to peace, give it over to God. Give it to God. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything, instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Step two is to rely on the Holy Spirit daily. Galatians 5.22 says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Step three is know and trust the word of God. I know it's abstract. I know it's, it's difficult. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. We can never control the uncertainties. We can never control the chaos or the challenges that get thrown at us. But we can choose this, to trust in Jehovah Shalom, who will be our peace, our joy, and our strength. If you'll stand with me, we're gonna finish on that. And if you just wanna raise your hands, we're gonna pray. Father, I thank you so much for this moment. I thank you for your people here. And Father, I just pray peace on them right now in every situation. I pray peace for those who are struggling with physical health. I pray peace on those that are struggling with difficult emotions. Father, I pray peace in financial situations and, and situations that are out of our control. Father, I pray peace in families, between relationships and marriages, Father. I pray peace at work. I pray, Father, that we will know your word for the truth that it is. And no longer will we swim about in the uncertainty but we will stand on your truth as Jehovah Shalom we will stand on your altar of peace going I know who my God is he is Jehovah Shalom the Lord is my peace Father I just pray over these people I thank you that you gave your life on a cross so that we could have eternal life and you secured our future that any who may believe in him can come to you Father, I thank you for all that you are and all that you have done, that your word is always true, your covenant always prevails. And I pray that we can trust in your word and in who you are. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.